Today on North02, we are going to be talking about Otabanga, a pygmy from the Congo who was a victim to a variety of unfortunate events. He was born in 1883 in the equatorial forest near the Kasai River in what was then the Congo Free State. Colonial rule and tribal conflicts have historically not mixed well in Africa. Even worse, hunter-gatherer tribes have often been the victims of larger groups. One day after an unsuccessful elephant hunt, Ota returned to find his village slaughtered. The perpetrator was the Force Publique, an exceptionally brutal military force established by King Leopold II of Belgium. It was a militia to control the natives. With his wife and children slaughtered, Oda himself was soon captured and sold into slavery. Most slaves were doomed to a life of hard labor exploiting the large supply of rubber in the Congo. But his story would not end there. In 1904, American businessman and explorer Samuel Phillips Verner traveled to Africa. Under contract from the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, he was sent to bring back and capture an assortment of pygmies. Werner encountered Oda's slave owner on the way to another pygmy village. With only a pound of salt and a bolt of cloth, he purchased the poor man. Werner later claimed that he had rescued Benga from cannibals. The two traveled for several weeks together before arriving at the Batwa village. Werner attempted to recruit more villagers, but the people of the village had grown distrust in the white men. Benga was very thankful to his now owner and convinced some of the Batwa men to come with him, for he himself was curious of the white man's world and willingly wanted to visit. Four Batwa, all male, ultimately decided to accompany them. Werner also recruited other Africans who were not pygmies. Five men from Bakuba, including the son of King Nadambe, ruler of the Bakuba. The group were taken to St. Louis, Missouri in the late June of 1904 without Werner, as he had been ill with malaria. The Louisiana Purchase Exposition had already begun, and the Africans immediately became the center of attention. Bango was particularly popular because he had an amiable personality, and visitors were eager to see his teeth which had been filed to sharp points in his early youth as a ritual decoration. The Africans learned to charge for photographs and performances. One newspaper account promoted Banga as the only genuine African cannibal in America, and claimed that his teeth were worth the five cents he charges for showing them to visitors. When Werner arrived a month later, he realized the pygmies were more prisoners than performers. Their attempts to congregate peacefully in the forest on Sundays were thwarted by the crowd's fascination with them. McGee's attempts to present a serious scientific exhibit were also overturned. The Africans performed to the crowd's preconceived notion that they were savages. Banga and the other Africans eventually performed in a warlike fashion, imitating Native Americans they saw at the exhibition. The Apache chief Geronimo grew to admire Banga, and gave him one of his arrowheads. Though this situation is entirely tragic, as a history buff, it is extremely fascinating. Benga accompanied Werner when he returned the other Africans to the Congo. He briefly lived amongst the Batwa while continuing to accompany Werner on his African adventures. He found a Batwa woman who he eventually married. Tragically, she later died of a snake bite. Benga did not feel that he belonged to the Batwa, and of his own choice, he returned to the United States with Werner. Werner eventually arranged for Benga to stay in a spare room at the American Museum of Natural History in New York while he was tending to other businesses. The curator of the museum was impressed with Benga and welcomed him. He initially enjoyed his time at the museum, where he was given a southern-style linen suit to wear when he entertained but he became homesick of his own culture. The writers Bradford and Bloom imagined his feelings. What at first held his attention now made him want to flee. It was maddening to be inside, to be swallowed whole so long. He had an image of himself, stuffed behind glass, but somehow still alive, 
crouching over a fake campfire feeding meat to a lifeless child. Museum silence became a source of torment, a kind of noise. He needed birdsong, breezes, and trees. Banga began acting out in violent ways until the curator asked Werner to find a new home for him. At the suggestion of the curator, Werner took Banga to the Bronx Zoo in 1906. William Hornady, director of the zoo, initially enlisted Banga to help maintain the animal habitats. However, Hornady saw that people took more notice of Banga than the animals at the zoo, and he eventually created an exhibition to feature Banga. At the zoo, the Mubiti man was allowed to roam the grounds, but there is no record that he was ever paid for his work. He became fond of an orangutan named Dohan, the presiding genius of the monkey house, who had been taught to perform tricks and imitate human behavior. How sad is it that he was so lost in cultural identity that he took more comfort with the company of an orangutan. The events leading to his exhibit alongside Dohan were gradual. Benga spent some of his time in the monkey house exhibit, and the zoo encouraged him to hang his hammock there and shoot his bow and arrow at a target. On the first day of the exhibit, September 8th, 1906, visitors found Banga in the monkey house. Soon, a sign on the exhibit read, The African pygmy, Otabanga, age 23 years, height 4 feet 11 inches, weight 103 pounds, brought from the Kasai River, Congo Free State, South Central Africa, by Dr. Samuel P. Werner, exhibited each afternoon during September. The pygmy exhibit was immediately controversial. In addition to what we would call a natural aversion to locking someone up as a zoo exhibit, some Christian ministers objected to the demonstration of the Darwinian theory of evolution. They thought that Oda represented some form of missing link, and seeing him with the monkeys was disturbing to them. African-American clergymen immediately protested to zoo officials about the exhibit. James H. Gordon said, our race, we think, is depressed enough, without exhibiting us with one of the apes. We think we are worthy enough to be considered human beings with souls. The zoo discontinued the exhibit in the monkey house, not because of the immense cruelty of considering Ota subhuman, but because it promoted Darwinian evolution. Ota went back to work at the zoo, but now was hounded by visitors as he walked on the zoo grounds. An incident with zookeepers in which he apparently threatened them with a knife led to his removal. First to a New York orphan asylum and later to Lynchburg, Virginia Seminary. In Lynchburg, Odo Banga's pointed teeth were capped and his name changed to Odo Bingo. He briefly worked in a tobacco factory before turning to odd jobs in return for room and board. He made friends, but it was hard to convince people of his impossible story. In 1914, when World War I broke out, a return to Congo became impossible as passenger ship traffic ended. Banga became depressed as his hopes for a return to his homeland faded. On March 20, 1916, at the age of 32 or 33, he built a ceremonial fire, chipped off the caps on his teeth, and shot himself in the heart with a borrowed pistol. Rest in peace, Oda Banga. A fascinating story of a man who found himself living a seemingly impossible life. Fortunately, in modern times we have recognized that we are all equal. All humans currently alive are one species. I hope you enjoyed this tragic but fascinating story of Oda. As always, make sure to like and subscribe. I make a variety of videos on a range of topics including dinosaurs and history like this video. If that sounds interesting, check out my other stuff too. I'll see you on the next episode of Northo 2. See ya.